Hello, my name is Dr. Malkowski, and thank you so much, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction. I'm happy to be here today presenting to you the gut microbiota and stress. Let's begin. Today, we have some learning objectives. We will begin by describing how the dysbiotic gut bacteria can influence neurotransmitters in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, including fecal short chain fatty acids, secretory IgA, intestinal permeability, inflammation, disease, and we will touch upon autoimmunity. We will also explain how ACEs and stress can lead to disruptions of the gut microbiota and contribute to a vicious cycle. We will identify the gut bacteria that can benefit stress-related adverse health outcomes, such as dysbiosis and pathogen advantages, and increased intestinal permeability. To begin, we will read a quote from Hippocrates. All disease begins in the gut. And the father of medicine understood this in third century BCE, now we're living in a time of advanced technology and understanding, so let's delve a little deeper into that adage. Microbiota. Specifically, microbiota is the micro microorganisms within the colon. We're generally speaking about bacteria, although microbiota also includes archaea and viruses. At this time, we do not have evidence for archaea implicated in physiology, but we, so we will focus on bacteria. Viruses do play a role, but we will not talk about that today. The microbiota within the human colon protect us from invasive pathogens and are involved in a variety of physiologic functions, including bioactive molecules, neurotransmitters, fatty acids, and vitamins. They are also involved in influencing neurotransmitters, including histamine, gastrotransmitters, neuropeptides, steroids, endocannabinoids, and many more. The microbiota are really the starting point of priming the host's immune system. In our colon, this is where our physiology meets the external environment, and that's really where priming that immune system begins. Alterations here can have a variety of physiological implications, including inflammation, metabolic disorders, lipid accumulation, glucose regulation, insulin sensitivity, chronic disease and immunity. The gut microbiota, the first bacteria to colonize the human gut is actually the Clostridia species. Within the gut microbiota, there's multiple phyla. Two of the main phyla, the bacterioides and Formicutes, are well known. Additional major phyla include the actinobacteria, the vermimicroba, the ternicutes, and the proteobacteria. With regards to the gut microbiome and the microbiota, we do want to talk about bacterial abundance and diversity of the phyla and species. This is not a reductionist, singular, specific point here. This is a dynamic ecosystem with over 10,000 species, and that dynamic balance is really going to implicate human physiology. Of note, the microbiota is really developed within, the, within those first three years of life and is established between the ages of two and five to basically uh, set the tone for the human microbiota for the rest of your life. This is a vast, vast system. The Actually, the microorganisms outnumber human cells by 10 to 1. And they make up two to six pounds of bacteria within our human colon. So this is a large physical presence as well. Some key bacteria that we will discuss is the fecal bacterium protonitiae, the acromensia mesinophila, and the facile bacterium. So there are key players that we do know with regards to human physiology. Here's an example of the gut microbiota mapped out by phyla. So we have the six main phyla here. In the center, we have an example of the patient's microbiome. It is that white webbing there superimposed on the normal biotic reference range. And the idea here is to show uh, balance with regards to abundance and diversity of the phyla. We'll see within the different phyla, we do have key players of bacteria, 
we, the well-known Clostridia lactobacillus within the Firmicutes group, and maybe the lesser known Escheria and Pterobacteria within the Proteobacteria group, just as examples. Again, abundance and diversity is really key here. Here we have a graph that's going to introduce us to our topic, which is the microbiota and stress. We have bacteria obviously all over our body. We're gonna talk about the gut today and specific bacteria within the gut that respond to stress. As we can see, there's a lot here and some of them are within this pathogenic bacteria category. Example, E. coli, Salmonella, and Yersinia enterolytica, they actually prefer norepinephrine and dopamine, and therefore when our body is stressed, they can essentially feed off of these stress neurotransmitters and have a wonderful, um, wonder these stress catecholamines and really have a great environment for their survival. Additionally, norepinephrine and adrenaline bind to a specific kinase on E. coli, and that is actually associated with helping E. coli in advantage in response to translocate and to actually connect to the colonic wall. So these bacteria are brilliant and they really do like our stress catecholamines. We're going to briefly discuss the microbiome just in terms of terminology. The microbiome is the gut bacteria and their genes. And generally speaking, the microbiome is what we're talking about in health these days. The microbiome gut brain access is a trend. So the microbiome is that is the terminology, it's the bacteria and their genes. And the microbiome is formed at birth, the in ideal situation, it would be formed via inoculation through the passage of the birth canal. The human body during gestation undergoes a dramatic microbiome shift to prepare for the birthing process. Um, at this point in time, we do know that C-sections are increasing, and when babies are born via C-section, 80% of these babies have been shown to have a hospital-acquired microbiome versus 50% of vaginal births. Within those C-section guts, we did notice that there are increases in these opportunistic bacteria that we associate with, with hospitals like Klebsiella and Enterococcus. And also within the C-section babies, we noted that bacterioidetes, which is a very healthy bacteria, was low at birth. And there was also delayed colonization of bacterioides fragilis. The implications there are Th1 activation. So the Th1, Th2 balance, potentially an underlying mechanism here with the associations with C-sections and asthma and allergies. Of note, when babies were six to nine months of age, these differences largely disappeared, okay? And also the C-section babies, even though uh, they, they were improving, they still had low bacterioides in their gut, bacterioides. Potentially, a solution here is going to be vaginal swabbing. What, what is done is that after the baby is born, within two months, the vagina is swabbed and then that is inoculated onto the human skin. This is a potential remedy and this has been proven in studies as well. This is something to consider because in the United States, we're at a 30% C-section rate within Latin America, it's a 50% C-section rate. So this is definitely interesting consideration here. Here we have an example of a cultured stool result with Klebsiella. So Klebsiella is, again, that's going to be the bacteria that's associated with dysbiosis, a hospital-acquired gut via C-section. And here we see this it would, would be what we'd expect to see in a C-section baby with these elevated Klebsiella. We have a little higher alpha hemolytic strep here and then some dysbiotic bacteria excuse me, the dysbiotic Klebsiella, the Morganelli, and the Citrobacter. So we do have a dysbiotic bacteria here and then some higher imbalanced bacteria. All right, next point we will discuss is exactly how the mi microbial, the microbiota affects the host. And here we have the beautiful microbiome gut brain access. This is a very complex system. Essentially, the 
the beginning is going to be the bacteria within the human colon. And then the bacteria within the human colon create the short chain fatty acids and the metabolites, which go on to communicate with the automatic nervous system, the vagus nerve, and the hypothalamic uh, pituitary adrenal access. Really then the vagus nerve is like the highway and it carries those signals to, to the brain. So the crosstalk really begins with the bacteria and then their microbial metabolites essentially ride on the highway of the vagus nerve to communicate to the brain really. And this is a complex communication system. There is crosstalk involved here and specifically this is involved in immune regulation and neurotransmitter function. Within the, within the host, we do know that the microbiota really affects host physiology. Implications here are within IBD, asthma, uh, cardiometabolic syndrome, CVD, immune-mediated immune disorders, and even neurodevelopmental delays, such as autism spectrum disorder. And the bacteria are very, very smart. Just of note, they do communicate together and they're really working constantly for their own homeostasis and their survival within our colon. They can even horizontally transfer genes to, to survive. So they're very, very intelligent. Of note, Bacteriodes fragilis, um, a specific bacteria here, is involved in that Th1, Th2 response. So potentially having higher bacteriodes vigilis is going to be associated with asthma, allergies, et cetera. That is one um, association that we, we do know of. The microbiota also themselves are involved with bile acids. They're, invi they're involved in deconjugation, dehydration, and dehydroxylation. So they're really influencing that as well. Um, and then the bile salts within the liver. And then the gut microbiota are also involved in intestinal permeability, autoimmunity, and as we'll see later, actually directly can influence catecholamines. Here, excuse me, here we have an example of the enterochromaffin cells. And this is to explain about serotonin. It is always noted that people are commonly saying, well, 90% of serotonin is, is made in the gut. And while that is true, uh, we know that that serotonin actually doesn't cross directly to the brain. It is via microbial mediators, again, using, using the vagus nerve. So the enterochromaffin cells, they communicate uh, afferent nerve terminals to the brain and then that those signals are, are given to the brain to influence serotonin in the brain. And really the Clostridiale species in the presence of dietary tryptophan is the precursor to this. So again, here we have an example of how within the human colon, we are using cells within the human colon uh, to, to create serotonin, traveling, the signals are traveling via the vagus nerve and influencing the central nervous system. So that is the mechanism there. Of note for serotonin, especially in children, so tummy aches and stress, kids don't present with headaches when they have stress like adults do. They present with tummy aches and potentially the mechanism of action there is serotonin. There's serotonin receptors all over the body, but the serotonin in the gut is exactly what we're talking about. Um, but interestingly enough, it has been noted that potentially SSRIs do, are not only able to treat depression, but have also been shown to improve GI disorders. The mechanism of action, again, is on the serotonin receptors in the colon. Also of note, potentially uh, the gut microbiome has been shown to, in these cases where they're using SSRIs, to return to normal within two weeks of living stress-free. So that's going to be the goal here, consideration change within two weeks. Another important factor here is Clostridia species. The Clostridia species really do implicate within the catecholamines, especially norepinephrine. With regards to the microbiome, 
one of the methodologies that we can gather clues about the influence of bacteria is within a germ-free model. So germ-free models when the animals have essentially no bacteria within them, and then we can see what, what happens to them. In this case, we have germ-free animals, and they had very low norepinephrine in the gut and then in systemic circulation. Then when Clostridia species were added to the gut, epinephrine returned to normal. Of note, also the germ-free animals, the mice displayed significant turnover of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. And so they were just burning through these neurotransmitters in the brain, and also they were low in systemic circulation. Additionally, as you may be aware of the addictive effects of cocaine and sugar, and that is going to be suggested with regards to the dopaminergic pathway, okay? And there are some studies that decreased gut microbial abundance does influence this dopaminergic addictive pathway and remediating microbial abundance actually serves to decrease sensitivity to the addictive behaviors of uh, the substances such as cocaine. So that's an interesting implication here for the gut microbiome and dopamine, all right? Another consideration here is going to be short-chain fatty acids. Are, they are involved in this dopaminergic reward pathway, and short-chain fatty acids are directly derived from the microbiome, the bacteria. So there is a strong connection here between uh, the gut microbiome abundance and diversity and the dopaminergic pathway. All right, now we're gonna talk about the intestinal barrier. And so here we have, here we have, oh, excuse me. Now we're gonna talk about the intestinal barrier. And so here we have an example of a healthy intestinal barrier. Within the colon, we have the bacteria. And those bacteria, ferment the diet to create short-chain fatty acids. The expected beneficial bacteria we see within there would be, example, the Clostridia species, Lactobacillus, Bifidobacterium, Fecal Bacterium Prudnitziae, and the Acromantium acinophila. Those are the keystone, the key players that we think of. And then they would ferment uh, soluble fibers specifically to create short-chain fatty acids. And then that is going to go on to create this very healthy mucus blanket. And the mucus blanket is a barrier and it's gonna protect the inside of the colon with the colonocytes. And then from there, you do have a healthy intestinal barrier with the tight junctions and a healthy mucosal layer. And so a great um, protective barrier there. Right. The, the secondary consideration here is actually going to be intestinal permeability. So if there's a breakdown, I'm just going to flip back here. If there's a breakdown at any point, especially with the, these bacterial species, their short-chain fatty acids, secretory IgA, then you get intestinal permeability, right? The contributing factors to intestinal permeability are going to be lifestyle, alcohol, drugs, and then we have some food proteins like gliadin, potentially endotoxins, glyphosate, which is ubiquitous now, is potentially associated as well, cancer treatments and radiations, and then potentially sugars, uh, metal oxide nanoparticles, surfactants, and sodium chloride. It, intestinal permeability is the potential precursor to immune and inflammatory responses. And then that will actually further exacerbate intestinal permeability and further cause increased intestinal permeability. So a vicious cycle there. Intestinal permeability has been so associated with advanced age, type two diabetes, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, multiple sclerosis, and irritable bowel syndrome. Additionally, Intestinal permeability is a dynamic system. Here we have a photo of some beer and some bread, so maybe a typical standard American diet. That is actually going to contribute to intestinal permeability with the alcohol and the gliadins here from the bread. And so a patient actually might have increased intestinal 
permeability after if you um, are looking at that uh, in the after they had consumed this type of food, okay? So the diets are gonna be high fat, low soluble fiber, low nutrition, potentially actually starvation diets, and maybe for patients doing a fasting diet, those are very popular now. And also, like we said, when there's disruption in the microbiota, and then we have decreasing mucosal barrier, those bacteria can actually directly touch the endothelial cells, and that in itself is going to lead to intestinal permeability, specific GI inflammation like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's. Uh, chronic stress actually leads to intestinal permeability on its own, and of course, oxidative stress. Yes, stress equals intestinal permeability. Here we have a study, a recent study that was done in the Arctic with the Norwegian army. Uh, number one, being in the army can be stressful. And number two, living in the Arctic definitely can be stressful. So of note here, stress in itself led to GI distress and intestinal permeability. All right. In this study, you know, they noticed that increased stress leads to intestinal permeability, decreasing in the bacterioides species was noted as well. In this study, they actually used carbohydrate supplementation to improve the, that, uh, to improve the intestinal permeability. So that is pretty interesting. Um, definitely more research is needed around that. Here we have a test testing methodology for intestinal permeability. This is zonulin, technically zonulin family protein, and this is a study done within serum. So this is a very simple vini puncture, and this is correlating with the lactulose mannitol drink test. Either test, you will get the same results. When the zonulin family protein is elevated, that is an indication of intestinal permeability. So here we have a patient stressed, increased intestinal permeability, and we can see it on the lab with the zonulin. What would be the next steps? So we definitely want to restore the gastrointestinal mucosal barrier, definitely consider dietary changes, absolutely gluten-free, potentially alcohol-free, remediating the oxidative stress, uh, decreasing sugar, etc. cetera. Uh, dressing, and treating dysbiosis, recall specific bacteria, bacterioides, acromensia, mucinophila. These are associated with mucosal barrier integrity, which is potentially precursor to intestinal ability, permeability. So identifying and addressing dysbiosis is warranted. Additional considerations include digestive support, anti-inflammatory therapies, and specific supplements. So vitamin D, vitamin A, quercetin, retinol, turmeric, gamma linolenic acid, omega-3 fatty acids, the EPA and the DHA, aloe vera. Additionally, you can consider zinc, beta carotene, pantothenic acid, glutamine as well. So there's a, quite a few things you can do here, um, definitely. All right, with regards to Intestinal permeability consideration is autoimmunity. So we did mention vitamin D is important here. And vitamin D is actually very uh, important with regards to intestinal permeability. It is noted that when patients have low vitamin D, that is associated with intestinal permeability and potentially associated with autoimmunity. So there is a connection here with vitamin D, intestinal permeability, and autoimmunity. Also of note, it's going to be um, consideration again with IBD, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. So there is an association here. Okay, so vitamin D again is very important for autoimmunity, but also for the gut and the intestines in themselves with the permeability. Secretory IgA. Secretory IgA is a very important protective mechanism within the colon. Interestingly enough, uh, during acute stress, secretory IgA will elevate. So we're gonna talk about stress and secretory IgA. The first consideration is acute stress. During acute stress, secretory IgA increases. This is actually protective. Historically, 
during hunter gatherer lifestyle, our acute stresses would be physical potential potential physical harm to our body, right? If we're running from something or we're trying to catch food and we, we were bitten or cut on something, we'd want we want to be ready for an infection and to, to fight that off. So acute stress, secretory IJ is elevated, ready to respond. And potentially then after that stress has resolved, there is that compensation mechanism and secretory IGA is going to be within normal limits. Chronic stress though, however, we do deplete fecal secretory IgA. And then we run the risk of increased GI infection with decreased fecal secretory IgA. HPA access activation is also involved here, you know, because this influences the interleukins and the secretory IgA production. So there is a strong link with uh, HPA and fecal secretory IgA here. Okay. Um, the secretory IgA works together with the immune cells within the colon to really regulate that host response. So that identification of, of self and non-self with uh, developing the immune system and the secretory IgA is very involved in there. Short chain fatty acids are also involved here because they induce secretory IgA and mucus production to, to promote that healthy mucosal barrier integrity and uh, prevent pathogen colonization. So there's this beautiful intricate interplay between the immune system, short chain fatty acids, the microbiome, and then the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Here we have an example of a patient that uh, reported chronic stress and we see low secretory IgA. So we do have the immune markers here of note, lactoferrin, lysozyme, and calprotectin, potentially uh, associated with um, IBS, IBD, and then specifically secretory IgA. We do see a low secretory IgA here as a result of chronic stress. And then of note, the short chain fatty acids, recall these are associated as well, and we see lower butyrate um, and lower val valerate. So there is that intricate connection here with the short chain fatty acids and the stress and the fecal secretory IgA. And then this patient, of course, with this predisposition of low secretory IgA, they're gonna be more at risk for a GI pathogen. So what are we gonna do when the patients present with low secretory IgA? Well, of note, you can use specific probiotics. So Lactobacillus raminis GG and Bifidobacterium lactis. We'll talk about the Lactobacillus raminis very implicated here with stress. Saccharomyces boulardii is a yeast that you can also use. It's been noted to increase secretory IgA about 75%. So that's a good option there. Prebiotics, of course, we're going to use soluble fiber. Um, the chickpeas, red kidney beans, lima beans, those are the sources. And you wanna get up to 10 grams a day. Some people can't tolerate that, so go ahead and go low and slow. All other considerations include glutamine, omega-3 fatty acids, olive oil, zinc, vitamins A, and again, vitamin D. So vitamin D again. And then with these chronically elevated cortisol patients and low DHA, you know, consider secretory IgA. So these are things to kind of consider in tangent, cortisol, DHEA, and secretory IgA. Stress. So stress is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, probably everybody has experienced stress and has patients that have experienced stress. Potentially, there is a component here with our modern lifestyles uh, in chronic stress that is going to predispose us to increase sympathetic nervous system and decrease parasympathetic nervous system. And then that in effect will influence HPA access. And then that will in tune influence fecal secretory IgA. GI microbial composition is involved here, potentially decreased short chain fatty acids and increased intestinal permeability. Stress specifically influences the gut microbiota in a few different ways, and so we're going to touch upon those today. We do know that the, the colon is, you know, is actually where 
Uh, we make serotonin and half of norepinephrine is actually made within the colon. Dop dopamine is synthesized here as well. And also bacteria themselves can actually contribute to levels of catecholamines. So the presence of bacteria can influence the production of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. All right. Um, butyrate is also involved here, and it's potentially um, the rate limiting. Uh, but butyrate is involved in uh, the transcription of tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the rate limiting enzyme in the catecholamine biosynthesis. So the butyrate, which is directly derived from the bacteria, is going to be that rate lim influence that rate limiting step of the catecholamine synthesis. So another mechanism that the bacteria are associated with these catecholamines. Specific bacteria can actually synthesize direct catecholamines they can, that are direct exact analogs of the catecholamines. So we have specific bacteria that can make analogs uh, synthesize catecholamines that our body will actually recognize as these um, catecholamines. So bacillus species, proteus, vulgaris, cerita, mackins, and staphylococcus aureus, these species actually can synthesize catecholamines that our body uh, will recognize as our own hormones, interestingly enough. And then the bacteria actually express their own beta-glucuronidase enzymes, and that serves to separate norepinephrine and dopamine, and then therefore increase the levels of norepinephrine and dopamine. So these bacteria are, are pretty smart, and they have a lot of different mechanisms to ensure their survival. Mm -hmm. All right. And specifically, you know, it has been noted that the GI tract catecholamines when they're ice can be isolated from the gut and that the levels of norepinephrine and dopamine have increased in the presence of bacteria. Um, and then also during periods of stress, these catecholamines that are in the gut have been noted to spill over into systemic circulation. And then that increases systemic catecholamine values, which actually in turn increasingly um, supports the gut bacteria to, to, over, to overgrow. So there's again a cycle here. Um, and potentially, again, these catecholamines that are within the gut can actually influence the genetic composition of the the microbiome as well. So there's a direct connection there. Um, interestingly as well, norepinephrine, it can actually communicate salmonella. Nor in the presence of norepinephrine, salmonella can actually communicate a gene transfer to E. coli. So these bacteria are paying attention to these catecholamines and using them again for their survival. They're very brilliant and these are intricate responses. Of note here, in the presence of stress, the colon is actually set up to be prone to infections. So under normal healthy conditions, lactoferrin and transferrin act as bacteriostatic within the colon and that's healthy. Yet when the presence of norepinephrine excuse me, noradrenaline and the dopamine, then these, um, the pathogens will release virulence factors. And these virulence factors allow them to grab on to the colon wall. And normally the norepinephrine and dopamine set up with the, um, the norepinephrine and the dopamine now will interact with the lactoferrin and the transferrin. And instead of being bacteriostatic environments, they're actually using the iron chelating proteins as a nutritional source of iron for the bacteria. So the norepinephrine and the dopamine are actually helping the bacteria use iron to grow. It's, it's uh, quite interesting how it's involved there, all right? And then after several hours, it was noted that this is still set up with the lack of the bacteriostatic environment and the increased norepinephrine and dopamine. So this study here was a patient, uh, somebody was you know driving in their car and had gotten agitated on the way to 
to the place and then two, three hours later that, you know, they get to their, where they're going and they feel better, but then two or three hours later, they're, they're still under this stress response. Okay. Again, and then after four hours, E. coli is stimulated to grow. And then also in the presence of stress, E. coli enhances the sugar toxin expression. And again, the catecholamines inspire this, the pathogens to adhere to the gut mucosa. So they're sticking onto the colon. They're really getting comfy inside the colon. And then that's going to lead to intestinal permeability, translocation of these bacteria to the mesenteric lymph lymphs lymphatic tissue, and then maybe even sepsis as these bacteria translocate across the colon. All right. Okay. We're going to switch a little bit of gears here with regards to the microbiome, um, the gut-brain access, and behavior. Generally, we don't think about the microbiome with behavior, but it has been noted that di a less diverse microbiome has been associated with fear behavior. We do see extroverted behavior associated with specific bacteria, and especially in young boys, their temperament and how they handle stress is related to their microbiome. This is to introduce the idea of psychobiotics. Psychobiotics are bacteria administered for mental health because we do know there is this strong link here between the microbiome and behavior. So now we have the ideology that potentially we can use psychobiotics, bacteria for mental health. With regards to stress, we're gonna consider ACEs. These are adverse childhood experiences, traumatic events before the age of 18. And this is ne neglect, abuse, mental health by the parent, substance use, divorce, incarceration, and domestic violence. And ACEs are, have been linked to obesity, depression, diabetes, suicide attempts, heart disease, cancer, and COPD. So there is a dose response. The, the higher the ACE, the higher the likelihood of an adverse health event. And again, these are events before 18 years of age. And this is, you're looking at the adults and you're asking them before age 18, did you experience any of these? If the answer is yes, then there's increased likelihood of adverse health outcomes. Here is a survey and you can access these online. The questionnaire is regarding, again, abuse, neglect, incarceration, divorce, et cetera. Okay. With a score of four or more, again, there's a dose response, but four is with a score of four or more, we do have significant increase in health outcomes with regards to COPD increases 390%, hepatitis 240%, depression 460%, and suicide increases 1,220%. Okay. Potentially, now, potentially microbiota is the missing link because we do know, so think about everything we've learned so far. We do know that the microbiome is potentially established at birth, yet if there is a hospital birth, potentially we have a setup for dysbiotic bacteria, okay? And we do know that the microbiome, there's a great connection here between the gut microbiota and the brain. And we do know that the microbiome can influence our behavior, our temperament, the way we handle stress, our fear response, right? We also know that in childhood, if adverse events are in trauma are specifically associated with adverse health outcomes, potentially the missing link between that, the childhood trauma and the adverse health outcomes as an adult will be the microbiota. The implications here would be the HPA access, the neurotransmitters, sympathetic nervous system, microbial abundance and diversity, intestinal permeability, fecal secretory IgA. So as a practitioner, when we have a client, a patient that presents with COPD, liver disease, depression, yet they also had ACEs in a child, are we doing them a service when we're just talking strictly about um, ALT and AST. Should we actually consider psychobiotics in addition to, uh, you know, evaluating their stress and adrenals, etc.? Just a consideration here, okay? Psychobiotics again. The psychobiotics are going to be bacteria potentially to alleviate 
to improve mental health. And in this case, the ones that we do know, the key players, lactobacillus. So lactobacillus has specifically been shown to lower, lower corticosteroid and supplementation of lactobacillus helvictus and bifidobacterium has been shown to lower anxiety, lactobacillus helvictus and raminus, reduce anxiety and depression, okay, in animal models. All right, so potentially there is a place here for these psychobiotics. In children, consuming prebiotics had a significant decrease in plasma interleukin-6, so decreasing inflammation and a significant increase in bifidobacterium. And then it was noted that um, B impetus in adulthood improved immune system abnormalities and depressive behaviors, which were a result of early maternal separation. So we do have animal models here to let us know that there, there can be an implication for psychobiotics in adulthood as a result of, of trauma, early maternal separation in this case, okay? And the stress response, response to ACTH was reversed by administering B infantis and a greater response in subjects who had B impetus colonization earlier in life. So here's another clue that healthy bacteria in early in life improve health later in life. So it is known proper microbial colonization early in life does influence HPA access. Um, and then here's a study where, where they had the animals uh, and they were separating them from their moms, and that caused decrease in bifidobacterium and lactobacillus. And then even after they were resumed, excuse me, excuse me, even after in adulthood, the lactobacillus stayed decreased in these animals. So the implication is, is this happening in humans, and should we be considering psychobiotics in adulthood? All right, because intestinal dysbiosis and subsequent chronic low-grade inflammation are related here, and we know dysbiosis and low-grade inflammation is involved in a variety of conditions. Here we have a patient's results. This patient was very stressed, so she had some marital strife. She found her husband on online dating, and here we can see the very low Bifidobacterium and lactobacillus, which we know decrease in the presence of stress. Enterococcus is also low, but then we also see this really healthy bacterioides, Escherichia coli, and Clostridium. So the bacteria that are influenced by stress are decreased. Those that are not influenced by stress are healthy. So we see this dichotomy here, okay? But don't worry, because stress is dessert spelled backwards. Just go ahead and have a chocolate if you're stressed. Haven't you seen those commercials? It totally works, right? Of note, stress eating, all right? And stress eating is essentially defined by emotional eating, and this, these are foods of low nutritional value, higher calories, okay? These break-in foods, and we know sugar is very addictive, and we did talk a little bit about dopamine in the microbiome as well. So if you're stress eating, you're going to further create dysbiosis in your microbiome, which is going to further predispose one potentially to that dopaminergic pathway. Interestingly enough, stress eating begins as early as ages eight or nine years old, so pay attention in your patients. And it's more prevalent in millennials. The older generations aren't necessarily engaging in this behavior. Now, inflammation. Inflammation is the cornerstone of this as well, associated with stress, associated with a low fiber, high protein diet, then associated with dysbiosis, impaired intestinal permeability, and then potentially we're translocating these bacteria and increasing low rate inflammation, systemic inflammation, endotoxemia. So there's, everything is connected in this vicious cycle. Of note here are the inflammatory diets. The first pyramid on the left is the standard American diet. And we do know, we're all familiar with that diet. And then the second pyramid is the Mediterranean diet, which has a great deal of research um, and is potentially a good option. At, of note, at the bottom of the pyramid, we do see healthy meals with other people and sitting down and enjoying food with, with friends and family. 
that is not in the other pyramids, and that can actually be, decrease stress and improve health outcomes. The other pyramid is uh, the plates is actually Canada. It's interesting that um, you know they don't really have the glass of milk like traditionally in the United States. We have a glass of milk. So just to consider the diet and the inflammation component in association with everything we've discussed. Here we have a patient's result with the standard American diet, and we can see the standard American diet is inflammatory. We have a higher proteobacteria, which is inflammatory. And to, additionally, the same patient, we have a lower firmicutes, which is very healthy, lower lactobacillus. The lactobacillus looks good, but we definitely can see some improvements here, and the patient with the standard American diet is going to be predisposed to inflammation. And then if we add on top of that stress, potentially, you know, this could be really important for the patient's health implications overall. Considerations here would be adding uh, prebiotics. We wanna increase the fecal bifidobacterium and the fecal bacterium partnitiae, and then that should serve to decrease inflammation. So you can remedy this. All right, putting everything together. We do know dysbiotic bacteria influence neurotransmitters, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, secretory IgA, short-chain fatty acids, intestinal permeability, inflammation, disease, and autoimmunity. Gut bacteria and the catecholamines interact regularly. Addressing gut bacteria will benefit stress-related adverse health outcomes, such as further dysbiosis and pathogen advantages and intestinal permeability. We do want to consider in patients ACEs because early childhood stress profoundly influences adult health. Consider the underlying mechanisms of action here and consider potentially a connection in the gut microbiota. Additionally, stress and stress eating and standard American diets can further lead to disruption within the gut microbiome and a vicious cycle. In conclusion, gut, catecholamine, stress, and intestinal permeability are all closely interconnected and therefore should be addressed as such. Thank you for your attention.